So the image on the screen is the digital footprint of a relationship. Specifically, it's my relationship with my girlfriend and fellow Wolverine uh, over the past three years that I've known her. So I made this image by scraping my hard drive and the web to recover about a thousand digital messages that we had sent between each other. And for each one of these messages, uh, I plotted a bar on the screen. And I had who sent the message, the blue is me, the red is her. I had the medium that it was sent through, whether it was an email, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, the purple is instant messaging conversations. And then I had the date, the time, and the text, the content of the message itself. So I wanted to try to use this data to see if I could, if I could understand the evolution of my relationship, or maybe relationships in general. Uh, the first thing I did was, was start parsing the text of these messages to see when words would show up and how frequently. And very quickly, a story started to emerge. So like any uh, warm-blooded sophomore, uh, when I met a girl at a party, I said hi and immediately friended her on Facebook. Uh, so, you know, they say that the way to a girl's heart is through humor, uh, so apparently I had to work pretty hard at this because YouTube popped up as one of the most frequently used phrases as we sent videos back and forth. But, you know, it worked because our vocabulary started to shift and phrases such as I like you would pop up into conversations. And so far so good, I've been pretty lucky, and like has turned into love, and you can almost see the day, the very day that, that language started to shift as relationship moved from friendship to romance. So aside from just looking at, at the text, the content of these messages, I also learned a bit from the structure of this timeline. So as I mentioned, the purple are instant messaging conversations, and so their disappearance about three quarters of the way through this timeline really represents a technology shift. And so wrapped up in all of this information about how you know, relationships move from, from friendship to romance is really a lot of, of, of really insights into how we use communication technologies to maintain these relationships. And so then I started thinking, well, okay, how can I use this to, to make my relationship better? So the width of each one of these bars represents how long that person had to wait for a response. And so now I get to stand before you and make this grand gesture and say, Aaron, I'm sorry for making you wait so long to uh, return your phone calls. Uh, but, you know, the amazing thing about all of this is I didn't have to actively archive any of this data. This was just sitting there in my email client, sitting there on Facebook servers, and all I had to do was, was download it. And while this only represents a, a sample size of n equals 1, you know, you can think there are 500 million users of Facebook, each with an average of 130 friends, and so very quickly you can imagine numbers start getting up into the billions with, with nine zeros there. And Facebook uh, offers you a button to press that you can see every message you've sent back and forth with someone, every party you've attended together, and so you, know, you start thinking about the questions, well, what can we learn about cultures or, or generations if we had access to a billion of these timelines? And so this brings me to what I really want to talk about today, and that is this, this growing field of big data. So what is big data? Well, think about everything that you do uh, in a day. Uh, maybe today is a good example. And then think about how many of those things involve the internet or a computer. So just by virtue of using these technologies, you know, because of the way they work, all of these little bits of information are getting stored on hard drives and on servers, and these little, these digital breadcrumbs are, are encoding, you know, a lot about what we're doing, when we're doing it, and where we're doing it from. And so for the first time, really, researchers are being given access to these breadcrumbs, and we can start piecing together an incredible amount about the people and the behaviors that generated them in the first place. So uh, for the remainder of this talk, I want to share with you a few examples of how I use this big data in my research uh, in the human mobility and networks lab at MIT, uh, and, and maybe inspire you to frame some questions that you might have in terms of, of this data. But before I get there, I need to address the, the elephant in the room, and that is this issue of privacy. So the reason that all of this data is so incredibly powerful is because there's so much of it and it's so personal. And so whenever we, we are thinking about you know, looking at it, we, we need to preserve anonymity uh, and keep it secure. And so I want to, to uh, just say that you know, when we work with all these companies who provide us this data, we make sure it's anonymous. But you know, anyone wanting to look into this, uh, into this field, it's a big issue. And I hope we can keep an open mind about it, because I truly believe that the power of this data to, to teach us something outweighs the cost of dealing with these problems. So uh, the, the relationship that I showed you in the beginning really got at this question of how we communicate with each other. And 
services like Facebook and Twitter have really opened up enormous windows for researchers to look at how we share and consume information with each other. And the natural extension of that is to ask, well, can we see how people, how that consumption of information drives actions and choices? And so specifically, I'll focus on the choice to, to adopt a technology. So this could be uh, buying a book that someone recommended for you or signing up for a service. And uh, I'll look at Twitter because you know, I'm sure all of you are tweeting right now. But Twitter is really, uh, is really an example of a piece of information that can go viral. It's social, it's free, and, and it's really unlimited. So this is the United States, and we have the first three and a half million people to adopt Twitter. So if you adopted Twitter uh, before the end of 2009, look for yourself. Um, and, and I'm going to play this movie, and these dots are, are these cities, and they're going to grow as the number of Twitter users grows, and they're going to change color when Twitter, Twitter reaches this critical mass. So if I start this movie then, uh, this, this line represents the number of new users signing up every day, so we're off to kind of a slow start, but all of a sudden you see Silicon Valley starts lighting up, then, then Cambridge, where MIT is, Ann Arbor, Austin, Texas, now all of the country is, is reached this critical mass, and then you see this explosion of Twitter users at the end of 2009. And so the idea here is that we want to start you know, understanding the process behind this, because this is what was going on you know, when, when that musical was going viral on YouTube or whenever Charlie Sheen says something ridiculous. <laughs> so uh, you know, it's not so surprising that what we're seeing is Silicon Valley and then you know, other places that are young, tech-savvy demographics are, are adopting these technologies first. But we're seeing this on a massive, massive scale. So just by knowing you know, very simply when a person signs up and where they're signing up from, you can really get a clear picture of, of demographics. But then we can ask, well, what's happening at the end of this timeline uh, when you know, Twitter is just exploding? What are the forces behind that? And anyone who, who publishes books will be familiar with the Oprah bump. So that giant spike there was actually due to this single tweet when Oprah adopted Twitter and then you know, told everyone else to. And so this is an example of hyper-influential people that are driving massive adoptions of technologies. But that second bump, which is about half the size, is also a media influence, but it's a very different a very different one. Instead of one person driving it, you have tons of news outlets writing articles about the Iranian revolution and social media's uh, role in that. And so, you know, the idea here uh, is, is, is that we can start combining these things to, to really uh, get a good picture of, of what's going on at a very high scale. So you might be saying, well, I, I'm in this data set, I didn't adopt Twitter because of Oprah, and if you're sitting in this room, then you're probably right. Because if we look at Ann Arbor, they were totally unimpressed by Oprah's endorsement. <laughs> but, but Denver, Colorado, on the other hand, much different demographics, uh, was, was really into it. So the idea here is that if we understand how we communicate with each other, then if we have behaviors or information that we want to spread, and we want to spread them efficiently and effectively, then we can use uh, what we learn about this process to drive actions and choices in the future. But the other question that, that we might want to answer, instead of communicating with each other, we want to know how we're acting with our in environments. And so uh, to do this, we're going to need a sensor. And I'm willing to bet that almost everyone in this room has one sitting in their pocket, and that is a mobile phone. So there's been a lot of buzz recently about uh, you know, how your, your mobile phone provider is, is really stalking you and who's getting this data and, and what they're doing with it. So I sort of wanted to, to come here and introduce myself because I'm getting this data and I want to show you what I'm doing with it. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, it, it's really an amazing thing. So how does this work? Well, let's say you're walking down the street and, and you take your phone out to make a call or to get directions to a restaurant. And your phone, if it's a smartphone, you might connect to a GPS satellite. You could be connected to Wi-Fi in a cafe, and we know you can't be very far from that cafe. Or you could make a call on, on any old phone, and it will go through a tower. We know the location of that tower. And so we can combine all these things to pinpoint the location of a phone. And these, these predictions are getting incredibly accurate. So for any given phone, you can tell where it is to within about 25 meters. So this is you know, when things start getting creepy, but they also get really cool. Because we can say, OK, this is downtown Boston uh, on the, the bottom right here. And then MIT, where my lab is, is across the river in Cambridge. And we can start saying, well, what if we knew where three, you know, three or four million phones were across Boston? And we knew where, where, you know, how many phones were being activated uh, on every intersection of the city at every hour of the day. What would that look like? Well, it would probably look something like this. 
Uh, so, so this is uh, that map, but now each one of these bars represents uh, uh, one of these 25-meter boxes, and we know how many phones are there at every hour of the day for about four months. And so if we just play this in time, what you start seeing is, you know, this is the biology of a city. This is a city breathing, sleeping, uh, you know, the heartbeat, the pulse of the city. And, and right now you'll see the city sort of skip a beat, and I'll pause it here, and, and we can start asking, well, what's going on? So everything's blue. Uh, this blue means that everyone's using this location at night. Red would mean the morning. Uh, and, and we want to know what's going on here. There's tons of people, way higher activity. Well, if you look at the date, this is February 12th, a Friday, uh, at 9 p.m. So this is Valentine's Day weekend, and the whole city now is getting done with their dinners and, and you know, dispersing out through the city. So the idea behind this is that, you know, if we can start using this type of data to understand how people are, are using spaces in real time, you know, then we can design better transportation systems, we can make them cleaner, uh, more efficient, uh, and reduce traffic and pollution. Uh, or if you're an epidemiologist, you might ask, well, how can this help me make a better model of disease spread? And, and more abstractly, you know, we, we think about ourselves as, as having all of this autonomy and free will, and yet our behavior aggregates in these incredibly periodic, regular patterns. You know, and it really, it really sort of questions uh, you know, how, much, how much we're actually you know, cognitively doing. So, so the idea behind all of this is that if we understand how we're interacting with our environments, then in the future, we can, you know, we can design them better. And now, you may be saying, well, this is just looking at rich people with, with smartphones in a rich city in a rich country. But as Hans Rosling, a uh, famous Tedster and statistician, would say, uh, let my data set change your mindset. So if we look here at a map of mobile phone distribution for the nearly 5 billion mobile phones in the world, we see that this idea of developing versus developed world really doesn't hold water when we're looking at this particular uh, technological infrastructure. So the United States you know, has as many mobile phones per capita as a place like South Africa, and only a few more than, than Libya. And China, while its mobile phone penetration isn't quite as high, you know, the, the massive number of people means that the most mobile phones in the world are there. So the idea is that if we can design a better city in a place like Boston, where we can validate and calibrate all of our models with really expensive survey and census data, then we can bring all of those insights to almost anywhere in the world, because the world has all of these uh, you know, cell phones and technological infrastructure mostly in place, and it doesn't change from, from culture to culture. So you know, that's really where the power of all of this data comes from, is not just you know, the, the extreme level of detail that we can start looking into, but the fact that we can do it almost anywhere. And so this, this sort of brings me to my crazy idea, and the first part of that is, is a challenge to you guys, because you are really the generators of this information. You know, your tweets are the ones that are being archived, but also, you know, you will be the curators of this information as you go out and create the next generation of technologies and, and you know, run the companies that keep this data. And so we really need to be thinking not only about how we can use this data to, to learn something, but how we can package it and provide it back to the people who are creating it to influence actions or behaviors or teach them something. And when we start doing this, I think that this idea will get a little bit less crazy, and that's that we can and should use this massive amount of data to understand who we are today and better design for tomorrow. So with that, thank you very much.